So today is one of those uh, Sundays that is ordinarily very easy to recognize. It's Palm Sunday, and we traditionally have handed these palm crosses for us to wear on this Sunday. And believe it or not, this is the 20th time Karen and I have led worship on Palm Sunday here at Pine Shores. And when I think of Palm Sunday, the image of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey with the crowd waving palm branches and shouting excitedly, blesses the one who comes in the name of the Lord, truly is a joyous image for me. And I want to let it linger for you. And there's a painting that I found that kind of shows the joy and excitement of the fanfare and the high spirits and it doesn't take much to imagine that crowd, and I'm sure you have in your own brains images of, of that day. But what we also know is that within a week, less than a week, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem goes ugly. It's very ugly for Jesus. Ugly, very ugly, they're the words that hit me, and even though they're not the exact words of Dr. Fossey and Dr. Burks, it's an appropriate translation, ugly, very ugly. We have been given the data, infection, and death numbers that were beyond our imagination only about a month ago, and who would have who among us would have any idea that we would be where we are today? The economic news is painful, if not devastating. The unemployment rate is rising with over 9.5 million claims, and the projections is even more disturbing. As a nation, we're in for some difficult times ahead. We're in for some ugly, very ugly times ahead, and we cannot be dismissive of the impacts that it will take on us emotionally, personally, in our relationships, in our community, and in creation. So I have this expectation that as we know more about the situation we are facing, as the facts are presented, when we know what we're dealing with, we'll have the resolve, the knowledge, and the fortitude to overcome the health crisis, the economic impacts, and the relational disconnection that we are or we will be experiencing. And I'm not going to say anything that you don't already believe. There is nothing that we cannot overcome. There is nothing that we can't solve. There is nothing we can't do. We can be and we will be a very tough and resilient people in ugly times when we choose to be. So let's choose to be tough and resilient as we walk our way through this crisis because that's what God expects of us. God's expectation is for us to use the full capacities of our resources, which includes our deep and abiding faith and trust in God's incarnate presence. God expects the very best of us. Someone wrote, there is no medicine like hope, no incentive so great, and no tonic so powerful as expectation of something tomorrow. So the theme for this morning is expectations. Now before the things turned ugly for Jesus, we know that the crowd had expectations about him. They expected a Messiah of power and might. They expected a Messiah that would come and return them to their rightful status, filling, fulfilling the promises of a, of a land flowing with milk and honey. The crowd that day expected Jesus' claim as the Messiah would neatly fit into their religious, political, economic framework. John Meacham's 
in his new book, The Hope of Glory, Reflections on the Last Words of Jesus from the Cross, quotes scholar Paula Fredrickson and writes this about Jesus' entry. The elements for chaos was all there. Jesus teaches in the temple courtyard. The excited crowds collect there. In the intensity of the expectation that the kingdom was literally about to arrive, that Jesus was about to be revealed as the Messiah, that the restoration of Israel was at hand, they were restive and potentially incendiary. They had expectations about Jesus, about this day. However, God had dis different expectations for Jesus. God expected Jesus to embody God's very true nature, expected Jesus to be the tangible expression of God's love in the world. Jesus was literally expected to be God's human face. He was to embody identity and purpose for all believers of all times, even today. He was expected to live a life with genuine love, serving others, living with hope and peace, living life where justice matters, living God's way. God expected Jesus to offer hospitality to strangers, to set people free from their self-centeredness, transforming and attaching those who trust into the beloved community. God's expectation for Jesus was not to clear the rocks out of the way or solve a health crisis so that the beloved can, can sit comfortably and conveniently cruising without much effort with little attachment and no personal responsibility for our day-to-day -day action. God had expectations for Jesus, and let me say God has expectations for us. So the question begs to be asked, what are God's expectations for us in these days of physical distancing, of virtual worship, a at-home home sing for our daily, daily acts of communion at home or a drive-through communion? We're in a completely new territory here, and we're learning as we go. And as we respond with this physical distancing, hear this. The best way to keep the community together is to be distant physically. And I want you to tarry with that. Let it sit. The most faithful way to keep us together is to physically distance ourselves. And that's counterintuitive because we're a people who are expected to gather together for worship, and then we're expected to go out together to serve and to share. And in the ancient Greek, the word for the body of believers, the church, is ecclesia, meaning one's called out. But we're forced to stay in. And our daily routines have been stymied. Our ministry and mission seem dormant because we know. We know that some of our neighbors and our friends and our family are vulnerable to the economic uncertainty or the concern about not having enough food or supplies for the week or the month. We are aware of those who are scared and sick and lonely and alone. We know those whose bodies are shutting down and we know others who are grieving. We know that we are now the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ, and we are expected to care, to live a life filled with genuine love, serving others, living with joy, hope, and peace, living where justice matters, living God's way. And yet, it feels like there is only so much we can do there's only so much we can safely do for those in need. We're learning every day how to be faithful in this crisis. So what does God expect of us? 
Karen and I want to offer three internal expectations. It's the stuff that we can do inside ourselves. God expects us to make wise decisions. Don't be foolish. Listen to the experts. Follow the protocols. Keep the community healthy together. Proverbs 12, 15 reminds us, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to advice. God expects us to be wise, to make wise decisions. God also expects us always to choose faith over fear because when we give in to fear, you don't use the full capacities of, our, of your resources. You do nothing to help yourself or others. And in fact, when we choose to live fearful lives, we actually can do unhealthy things that can harm us, harm others harm our future. The psalmist writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Make wise decisions. Choose faith over fear. And the third internal is to trust. Trust God. Trust is what God expects from us. And even in the dark, when there's little or no clarity, God expects us to trust God more deeply. John's gospel, we hear these words, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So we choose wisely, wisely make wise decisions, live with faith over fear, and trust God more deeply. Each one of us can do those things during this pandemic. It's the internal stuff. So let's work on the internal stuff. But there's a few other expectations we can do as well. We can pray intentionally for and with each other. Now I'm guessing that you really don't need to hear that because you're probably already praying for lots of people. But literally, prayer is a way to stay connected during periods of distancing and isolation. Prayer creates intimacy. Think about that. Prayer creates intimacy. Intimacy with God and with those you are praying for because prayer draws us closer. It brings each other into our consciousness. So pray for each other, but there's something else we're gonna invite you to do. After you pray for that person, take another step. Text them, email them, call them, share a note. May even consider starting a weekly group of sharing prayers and following up with updates during the week. Through periods of isolation, prayer is an expectation because it is a faithful action. Now, another expectation God has for us is to simply check on your neighbors, especially think about those who are most vulnerable right now. Check on each other because We're the presence of love and compassion. Check on each other is an expectation. God also expects us to be creative, to find new ways to to be together, to build community. Since our physical presence is limited right now and nothing can replace seeing you face to face, but we're expected to do our best to show virtual love during this pandemic. God expects us to be creative. Now, thankfully, I can boldly declare that God expects us to take advantage of the solitude. A month ago, our lives were rushed and cluttered, and making time for solitude wasn't even practical. We don't make time for God in our hectic days, in our responsibility and task. We see now, we don't, have to, we don't have to force time. We don't have to force ourselves to make time for God in this crisis. The solitude offers that to us. We've already slowed down. 
We started cooking meals together and eating together, learning new skills. Some of us growing a beard to discover what they look like with the gray one. During this time of solitude, read books, write letters, work a crossword puzzle, try a new recipe, write haiku, or start a great American novel. Learn to play bridge. Call people you've just been meaning to talk. God expects us to take advantage of our solitude. And here's what we want you to do. Beginning this, this week, we want you to also email us an activity or action that you are doing in your solitude, not to fill it, but to value and grow in this time because we are always reminded between stimulus and response there is a space and that space, that solitude, gives us the power to choose our response. So make this opportunity Make it an opportunity for you to be creative in the solitude. And I'm hoping we get hundreds of email pictures from you. So stay wise. Live with more faith than fear. Trust God deeper. Pray and follow up. Check on your neighbors and your friends and your family. Be creative and value your solitude. That's what we can do to meet God's expectations.